My name is Jason. And my name is David. And this is Discern Realities, a Dungeon World podcast. Okay, listeners, we are here with Dungeon World Basics number four. Last week, we talked about the non-combat basic moves, and the week before that, the combat basic moves. This week, we're going to talk about special moves, and next episode, we'll be talking about the anatomy of a playbook. So special moves are today. Unlike the basic moves, special moves don't actually get used very often. In most cases, the purpose of special moves is to give some to give some mechanical weight to common scenes and situations you find in a party-based fantasy adventure. Things like making camp, taking a long journey, spending your money at the inn after you get back from the dungeon, that kind of thing. If you'll recall from the first Basics episode, we said that the moves in general help emulate the genre, and in particular in Dungeon World, the genre of Dungeons and & Dragons, and this is especially the case with special moves. So, David, what are we going to be doing today? Well, I mean, as you as you said, we're going to be talking about the special moves. We're going to go through the special moves. And uh, really, the special moves are not like the basic moves in that you don't have to think about them a whole lot. The text is pretty clear on what's supposed to happen for each and every special move. You don't need to have any judgment about it, at least not like a basic move. So for each move, we'll talk about them, and then we'll identify like trouble spots to be aware of them just based on our experience with the moves. Some of these moves, as written, may seem a bit boring or dull, but uh, your play experience will benefit a lot by it with a little bit of homebrewing, and we'll be referencing you to some Discern Realities episodes and other play aids that are out there in the world that will help you get the most out of these moves beyond their text. Awesome. Well, let's just go straight to it and start with Last Breath. So Last Breath, I think by far, is the most interesting special move, and it actually stands out as the one special move which does not match up with something that happens in Dungeons & Dragons. This move, essentially what it is, if your character hits zero hit points, we see a scene where they go to the Black Gate of Death, and... They roll 2d6 with no modifier in most cases. Uh, There are some playbooks that have a modifier on it, like the Barbarian. But in most cases, you roll 2d6 with no modifier. On a 10+, plus, you are going to escape death. Your character will recover from whatever dropped them to zero hit points, and um, and they'll survive the scene, right? On a 7-9, to they meet death, and death presents them with an option. And if they, it's essentially like a deal. If they take death's deal, they get to go back to the world of the living. Otherwise, they have to pass through the black gate and are dead. And on a six minus, they can't escape death. They, they pass through the black gate and your character is retired at that point. It's a very interesting thing. Like I said, there's nothing like this in Dungeons and Dragons. There is no, you know, you hit zero hit points or, or whatever. In, in second edition, you hit, um, it's, it's a negative. It's like negative your constitution score or something like that. But whatever the score is that you hit, once you hit it, you're just gone. That's it. So it's kind of cool. It's something that makes Dungeon World kind of stand out, right? As far as like this move goes, the key to this move is for the GM to make the seven to nine choice feel truly consequential. It's, the offer that death makes should challenge their character's worldview or create some kind of dilemma in the campaign world. And getting this right can be kind of tough. You know, sometimes there's a really obvious proposition, right, depending on what's been going on in your fiction. But other times it's not clear how you can make the decision painful enough to where they might choose death instead of actually taking the deal. But at the same time, not making it so painful that, you know, the option feels unfair, right? Right. If you're having a hard time figuring it out, you can ask the table for their opinion, right? If you recall, we said this in Basics 01, the game is a conversation, and this is one of those moments where the conversation is really powerful, just kind of talking it out as players rather than as characters. You know, what would be cool here, guys? What would be a really great offer for Death to make? This is the kind of situation where I think Dungeon World and its focus on the conversation really shines. 
For more discussion about Last Breath and particularly how to make the trip to the Black Gate a very exciting experience for players, um, I'd point you to episode 17 of Discern Realities and even episode one. I think it's the very first topic we talk about in the very first episode, if I'm not mistaken, where, where I think I recall a uh, an incident where a player of mine goes to the Black Gate. So in any case, episode 17 for sure. Uh, go check that out. Uh, David, do you have any thoughts here? There are just a couple of things that I would say, just based on the text of the move itself, while zero hit points are is typically what's going to get you to rolling this move, the actual triggering event is when you're dying. So if the GM should, for some reason, determine that you are dying, or, or the player thinks they might be, their character might be dying, that would trigger this move. And also, this move allows for you to glimpse death and then later on actually die from the roll. And and that's kind of from the, from the tail end of the text where uh, on a miss, your fate is sealed. You're marked as death's own and you'll cross the threshold soon. And the GM will tell you when. So if right now is not a great fictional moment for that character to die, then it could be handled in epilogue or something like that. It definitely, the fiction comes first in dungeon world. You can tell from this move, even if it's like the, even just sort of like, inconvenient for their character to be dead at this moment like for example they get a six minus or they don't take the proposition on a seven to nine in hour one of a three hour session right or hour two there's like more time to play find a way to let the characters survive until the end of the session at least and then they they pass on right you know maybe you can imagine a situation where they go down in the middle of a fight well maybe the fight's over they're not dead they're bleeding out and they still get to continue to travel with the party for a little bit maybe even do things like spout lore or things that don't require like physical activity you know as the you know party carts them around or whatever and then by the end you know they croak or whatever um that that's that's kind of what david's getting at there too also the note about dying is really interesting i can't remember exactly what the text of the rules say but i've often had situations where the only option is death <laughs> to just immediately trigger last breath or you know to to immediately trigger the move for example if a goblin sneaks into your encampment and cuts your throat that's not hit point damage right that's that's you bleeding out of your artery, <laughs> right? That's, that's last breath, right? Or if you take a, a fall from a castle wall, right? That's not hit point damage. That's just, do you maybe possibly survive that? Right, exactly. So yeah, be aware that the, the move does give you that flexibility. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's take a look at our next special move, encumbrance. So encumbrance, very straightforward. If you're carrying too much, you might have a penalty. Or you might just automatically fail if you're carrying too much. Two small things that you want to be aware, to, aware of, especially as you're creating characters. Uh, your load score, which is connected to the encumbrance move, is set out on, uh, on the playbook. And it's a number plus your STR modifier, not strength. So it's that little number that's the plus one, zero, or minus one, uh, potentially plus two, but... It's not the big number like 16. So be aware of that. Right. And that's how hit points work, right? Where you use the use the big constitution number, not the modifier. Right? Exactly. Yeah. The second thing to note is that load and encumbrance is irrelevant in the case of an, of an object that is just massive. Something that would prevent you from making a move, like trying to move a great big boulder or a piano or something like that. The example used in the book is the boulder, but I always think of two people moving a piano for some reason. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, any, I think it's just, it's one of those, like, it's one of those real, like classic sort of like, just be honest with the fiction moments, right? If you're carrying around a big ass chest full of treasure, you know, it, that, that's causing you to hunch over because it's on your back. You're probably not doing many actions, right? You, you're, you're, you're basically just calling that big ass chest, in which case load is kind of irrelevant. Like, like, you're just kind of vulnerable at that point, right? Actions and roles don't matter. Right. So if if it's a single great big object, question it and don't don't let them get away with that. If they're carrying lots and lots of small things that doesn't seem like they should be carrying it, it's probably okay as long as they're still doing their encumbrance thing. Absolutely. Very straightforward move. Let's talk about make camp. Make camp is another simple move via the text. 
the idea here is it's the classic scene in fantasy fiction, right? Where the group is sitting around the fire. They're going to, you know, tuck in for the night. They're maybe they're sharing stories. They're eating. They're doing all that stuff. Mechanically, what this move does is it abstracts that process and it gives you, you, you get to enjoy all the benefits from making camp, right? Such as getting part of your hit points back. Certain playbooks get access to uh, various playbook things that they have access to, like the wizard and spells, like spells get refreshed, that kind of thing. You know, here's the thing about Make Camp. It's a very simple move on paper. Make Camp is a great opportunity to really build out the fiction. I would advise you to resist the temptation to just sort of mechanically resolve the camp and then move on, right? Like that's how it would happen in a video game, right? In that video game, Darkest Dungeon, you sit down. When you remake camp, it takes like 30 seconds, right? Like we see the characters around the camp. They get all their hit points back. They get their little their little make camp moves done. And then, uh, and then you move on to continue the dungeon. Dungeon World and indeed role-playing games invite you to go a little deeper on that. For some really great advice on how to use Make Camp as a way to develop characters and to really foster intra-party bonding, I would point you to episode 55 of this show where we have a really great discussion about that. The next move on the special moves list, which is uh, very much connected to Make Camp, is Take Watch. Again, another classic moment in fantasy adventure fiction. Someone is on watch. You know, it's nighttime, everyone else is asleep, and something dangerous approaches the camp. What happens, right? It's a classic trope of D&D especially. Like, like make camp, take watch is not a complicated move. You can resolve it quickly with a die roll and then have the encounter as needed. But again, I would just stress that it's a great opportunity for the character on watch to actually work on some personal projects or even to develop their personal fiction a little bit. And for tips on how to make that happen, go see episode 55 again. Episode 55 has a really great extensive discussion about make camp and take watch. Um, for our purposes, for basics, super straightforward moves. Text as written works great. The next move we're talking about is Undertake a Perilous Journey. Again, this is all about emulating D&D genre. It is the move that abstracts uh, a major part of the fantasy, which is basically the, the entire book, The Hobbit, where you are going on a journey. Or, or, the, or Fellowship of the Ring, right? Or Fellowship of the Ring, yeah. That, that whole thing is just boiled down to this one move, and it's a long and perilous journey. The key thing the move arbitrates is ration use. Dungeon World rations represent your supplies, and the amount of rations uh, you have shows how far, how long you can stay on the road to get to the adventure or the dungeon before you have to return to civilization and restock. Another thing that this move arbitrates is whether there are dangerous things that are going to jump out and get in your way during the journey. Unfortunately, Undertake a Perilous Journey is generally not a strong move in the game, and for good reason, it's abstracting the entire Hobbit or Fellowship of the Ring. And you might want to give that a bit more flavor than just doing the move as written. It's one of the most interesting parts of a fantasy adventure. You know, they say it's it's not the destination, it's the journey. So let's get a little bit more out of that journey. And here's a few ways you can. Look at Perilous Wilds by uh, Lamp Black and Brimstone. Uh, look at Jason's custom move for this, uh, custom procedure for this move. It's found in the DR Annual, which is now on drive through RPG. We also talk about it in Episodes 5 and on Episode 41. Yeah, and we'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes, listeners, so you don't have to be writing this down like crazy right now. Undertake a Perilous Journey, I just want to jump in for a little bit. It's actually kind of a brilliant move because – and this is extra information, but whatever. <laughs> it's kind of a brilliant move because I will tell you, having run a lot of D&D, &D, this journey is can be quite uh, – the journeys can be quite tedious, right? When all you want to do is get to the dungeon or get to the adventure, the, the journeying part uh, using the scaffolding of Dungeons & Dragons um, – I can't speak to 5e, but for older editions of D&D &D at least – this – it was a bit tedious. And often it was really unclear like how you should even handle it, right? Like – what does it mean to travel X number of miles per day? You know, how much time should we spend on that? Like what happens on this journey? Do we have to bust the map out and figure out where they're at at any given moment? There, there were lots of like difficult questions with doing the journey in D&D. &D. I've always felt that D&D &D and role-playing games in general 
are not good at this. They're also not good at the things that make the journey interesting, right? Um, this is something we talk about on our other show, Fear of a Black Dragon, in the newest episode, in the Ultraviolet's Grasslands episode. The really cool part about fellowship and about Hobbit, about the Hobbit, or at least one of the major cool parts, is that bonding between the characters, right? Role playing games are really good at the fight with the cave troll and really good at running away from the org writers, but they're really bad at Boromir wrestling with the hobbits, right? Or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's really bad at, you know, the, the, the wonder and awe of seeing new things, right? Like the, the hobbits looking out over the ridge and seeing an olifant for the first time. Role playing games are not good at that part of the journey. And so, this move is also not great at those things. Um, but what this move does do, which is really nice, is it cleanly and quickly and neatly answers a lot of the questions about how long does this take? Will, will there be any trouble? And like, will that trouble get the bet? Like, will that trouble get the jump on us? Or will we get the jump on it? And, and basically, like, how much longer can we stay on this adventure? Right. Like the rations, like David said, they, the rations are a key currency and dungeon world like you know you spend some to get to the dungeon and then you spend them while you're in the dungeon and once they're out bad shit starts to happen right and so it's really good at abstracting and cleanly efficiently like taking care of this problem in role-playing games but it's a weak move in general because it ignores those things I talked about earlier, those sort of like bonding and sort of like gazing in wonder aspects of a fantasy journey. And so, yeah, like David said, definitely go check out Perilous Wilds. I think it's a, in many ways, there are better procedures in that book and it's all dungeon world compatible. I think my custom procedure in the DR annual is, is really good. And, and of course those episodes that we mentioned, it's a great opportunity. Like undertake a perilous journey. If there's ever a dungeon world 2e, I hope this is the move that gets fixed. Yeah. And I mean, it's not a big fix. It, Jason's custom procedure is really mirroring the move and adding fiction to the mechanics, which is, which is what it needed. One other thing I will mention since we just talked about make camp, take watch and undertake a perilous journey. Even if your perilous journey is multiple days, do not feel like you need to make a camp every single day of that journey. No, and indeed you should not. Yeah, it, that's assumed to be, yeah, it's assumed to be included in the role, right? Uh, next is end of session. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a purely procedural move. I'm not even sure it's really a move because it's not something the characters are – it's not an action the characters are doing. It's a sort of out-of-character procedural thing. There's almost nothing to discuss here. The one thing that I guess the one question you might have is what does it mean to resolve a bond because you have to check uh, if you resolved a bond. That's something we're going to cover in a little more depth uh, next week on the Anatomy of a Playbook episode. But essentially – Resolving a bond means the bond statement on your playbook, if it no longer applies because the circumstances between the characters or the object of the bond have changed, then it's resolved. That's, that's essentially it. It's, it's a, it's purposely a little nebulous and fuzzy. You can be kind of generous in, ter in interpreting whether a bond is resolved or not, right? Um, otherwise, end of session, uh, just a total procedure. Nothing, nothing too complicated there. Same thing with level up, which is the next special move. Again, level up, this is an out of character thing. Uh, it's kind of strange for it to be written as a move, but in any case, another, it's another procedural move works exactly as written. The next move we're going to talk about is Carouse. This is another good move, another fun one that is emulating the genre. Uh, it's similar to Make Camp and Perilous Journey, and you can get a lot of good fiction out of this. If you let it stretch out, let the scene breathe a little bit, or even let it stretch onto multiple scenes. Uh, something to be mindful of, if the, player's if the player doesn't choose, you are not entangled, ensorcelled, or tricked. Uh, set them up so that they are entangled and sorcerer or tricked. It's it's pretty easy. It can be something as simple as they get pickpocketed because they got drunk. Other ideas for entanglement, maybe they get caught up in some local drama between NPCs, and they get ensorcelled. Perhaps this is the time that the wizard they pissed off from forever ago, three sessions ago, five sessions ago, whenever, gets their revenge by afflicting them with some magical curse. We talk a bit about the Carouse move on DR Episode 2, if you would like to hear more about that. Yeah, Carouse, another uh, – yeah, like David said, another great opportunity to build out that fiction. Supply is the next special move. Again, very straightforward. 
the only slight question that might come up with the supply move. So first of all, what is the supply move? The supply move is you go into a settlement and you're looking to purchase something and this move adjudicates whether you can get your hands on it or not, essentially. A pretty classic, again, keeps, you know, a reminder, we keep saying it over and over again, the special moves emulate genre, right? This is a D&D kind of thing, right? Can I buy this thing in this town, right? The only slight question you might have here is how do you know if something is readily available in a settlement or not? If the GM has created the settlement using the procedures in the Dungeon World book, it shouldn't be too difficult to determine if something is available or not. And we'll talk about those town creation, settlement creations procedures in, a, in, a, in an episode down the road um, when we cover some sort of miscellaneous topics. Ultimately, though, it's kind of the GM's call. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, cities have most things available, particularly things made from metal and stone. Towns have most things available, but not things that require high levels of craftsmanship. And villages have only the most basic sorts of things available, usually things made with organic materials or less sophisticated craftsmanship. The next move that we cover is the recover move. And I have a lot of things to say about this. Oh, really? The, ne the next move we have is recruit. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> recover. There's nothing there. Read the text. It works exactly like that. There is no nuance on the recover move. If you um, don't understand the recover move, return your <laughs> copy of Dungeon World. But essentially, you go to town, you rest, you get your hit points back, and you clear your abilities. Done. Let's talk about recruit instead. All right. So recruit. In most games of Dungeon World that I've been a part of, in either watching it or playing it, I... I have not seen this move happen. I don't know if you have seen it happen or not, Jason. I think I've done it once in like, I've probably run or run and played in 500 sessions of Dungeon World, maybe more. <laughs> and, and I'm not exaggerating there either, listeners. I, I think I've done this maybe once. It's just not, it's just not something the, the way my adventures are set up. It just, just doesn't come up. Right. And I have similarly played in a great number, though not as many sessions of Dungeon World. And yes, I haven't seen it actually happen myself, but based on reading it and understanding how Dungeon World works, it looks like it should work as it is described. And it actually looks like it would be a pretty good time. It looks like there's some fun fiction that is tied to this move, unlike, unfortunately, Perilous Wilds. Oh, Perilous but, Journey. <laughs> Perilous Journey, sorry. <clears throat> uh, but most of the work here is done by the GM. So they need to come up with all the applicants, perhaps using the higher hireling rules to create applicants or simply relying on the notes for whatever adventure or module they are running. If I was going to add any more nuance to it, maybe ask your players around the table a good thing and a bad thing about an applicant. If you can't come up with your own, that's about it. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I, the one time I used it, the recruit move. And and again, just to, I don't know if we said at the, at the top of it or not, but basically this is how you you get like hirelings or other NPCs to join your group for, and usually you pay them, you put out word and depending on what kind of word you put out, you get a bonus on the roll and that determines what kind of person shows up. Honestly, the reason why I never use this specific move is mostly because I just handle it outside of a role. Like if they are looking for somebody, they just talk to people and find them. Uh, if there's a cool NPC they need to encounter, they encounter them. I, I don't normally go through this procedure to do that. <laughs> um, but the one time I used it, it was fun. I mean, I, I did the, the, I went the hireling route where I just created a handful of hirelings and of different skill levels. And basically we had a couple of like little kind of interview scenes, um, <laughs> with, with the, with the group. And, uh, yeah, it was fine. But honestly, I, the move itself is like, it's functional, but like it's, it's, it's not super exciting. Next move. What do we got? Outstanding warrants. I have literally no experience with this move. I don't run a lot of urban adventures, and so I don't have a lot of opportunities to use it. What it is, is if you are in a village or a town or a city, and you cause trouble because you are rambunctious, rabble-rousing adventurer types, and then you leave to go on adventures, and then you come back, you do the outstanding warrants move, and that tells us if there are warrants out for your arrest or if you have a bad reputation in that settlement. I have never, ever used this move. 
I don't think that's a knock on the move necessarily. Like I said, it, it comes down to the fact that I don't run a lot of urban adventures. And so there just aren't that many opportunities. And also in my games, I, I just handle this sort of thing outside the boundaries of the move. Again, kind of like the recruit thing. I, I don't really, I, I just have NPCs and that are like pissed off at them or, or maybe I make the NPC a part of my fronts or whatever. Um, and maybe they kind of harass the party or whatever, but I don't need, I don't, I don't use the move to arbitrate this for my games. I just kind of do it. But that said, it seems like a solid move. You can see the reason for its existence. There should be some kind of penalty for acting like a fool when you're in town. And this is one of the ways you can have a penalty imposed on the group. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the recruit move and the outstanding warrant move, do a great job of signaling to people what the genre of this of Dungeon World is. It's it's D and D, and these are the kinds of things that would happen in D and D. But I've never had to use this move, and I have run quite a few urban adventures. I've just I've just handled it in in other ways uh, besides having outstanding warrants. Yeah, yeah. You you just haven't like had a formal mechan- mechanized move procedure for it, right? That's I I think we handle it the same way. It's like. Um, and that's how you would do it in D and D too, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's maybe this is just these two moves are maybe like a little heavy handed in terms of like genre emulation, but you know, whatever. Right, but they let you know, hey, these are the kinds of things that should be happening. Yeah. Well, and that's and one and and we should say like we keep repeating this thing about genre emulation, listeners, because one of the great strengths and powers of of Powered by the Apocalypse games is the moves do what David just said. They they goalpost for you, right? They tell you what the game is about based off how the text of the move goes. Like just the just the existence of the move like teaches you something about the genre. But seems like a solid move. I've just never used it. I think we have one more, all right? Last special move. Bolster. Uh this is a good move. It helps you kind of fill in the fiction between big adventures. It works as as written, but we do have a pro tip for you. Even we couldn't help ourselves. Have your players do a flashback when they spend their prep to show how their study or training or whatever is helpful to the situation at hand. It gives you some more background knowledge on them. And if you play like Jason and I do, where you don't front load a lot of that backstory, it's a fun way to see the backstory come to life in play. Absolutely. We talk a bit more about this on DR episode 54. Yeah, yeah. It is. This move doesn't seem like much on paper, but man, oh man, it can be such a powerful tool. Basically, you do the move, you get this like little currency called preparation, you spend it to get a bonus. But when they spend it, like David said, like, stop and like insist on a flashback, right? Th- those have been some of the best moments in my games of Dungeon World is that little flashback moment where they show how they got ready for this, like how they were prepared for this. It really, really adds a lot of texture, deepens the experience in a huge way. Yeah. And and this is like, this is a really nice thing to give your players to let them have these hold to, to spend because it turns a, it turns a six into a seven or it turns a nine into a 10. And, and when they really care about when the players really care about getting that role, this is a good way to let them have it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's go to the AP. Hi, listeners. I wanted to let you know about a couple of things. The first is that our Pride Month issue of Codex is now in our Patreon feed. Codex Glamour contains a number of great features, including a new skin for Monster Hearts 2, a gumshoe scenario about a vampiric David Bowie in 1970s Berlin, an original story game called Midnight at the Oasis, and three dozen cultural fashion items. To get Codex Glamour, just make a $4 or higher pledge on our Patreon by June 30th. That's at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. The other thing I want to talk about is related to Gauntlet Hangouts. Gauntlet Hangouts is the absolute best place to play indie RPGs online. Our calendar has more than 125 sessions per month across a variety of genres and game systems. Of course, those games are really hard to get into if you don't hold one of our $7 Patreon spots, because folks who hold those spots have early access to RSVPs, and the $7 Patreon spots are always sold out. Well, I'm very excited to let you know that we will be making more of the $7 spots available on July 1st. On that day, we will open up 75 more spots, and believe me, they're going to go fast. To find out exactly when they drop that day, be sure to follow us on Twitter at GauntletRPG. Thanks. Okay, we are continuing our actual play featuring the adventure of Lucero Castafiel. And when we last saw Lucero, 
he had gone pretty far underground. The sort of subterranean area beneath the temple stopped being masoned at a certain point and just went into like natural cave. And he traveled down the natural cave a bit and got to what looks to be a very like interesting ritual space in this sort of like wide, wider cave space. And he noticed some symbols in this ritual space that indicated to him, or at least help him put the pieces of the puzzle together, that the Temple of the Peerless Star, the adherents of the Peerless Star philosophy are actually trying to master life and death. Indeed, they are trying to figure out ways to bring the dead back to back to the world of the living. And indeed, the Peerless Star may not be a star at all. They believe it is a manifestation of the negative energy plane that is the energy that allows you to create undead things, right? And so, Lucero, you had mentioned that you were kind of walking around, looking at some of the symbols and things like that. As you are walking around the altar area, you start to hear murmuring coming from somewhere. The murmuring doesn't seem to be a language that you recognize, and it sounds like it might even be the murmuring of many voices. It's kind of like a but you can't quite make out where it's coming from, at least there on the spot. What do you do? I mean, I can't tell where it's coming from. So I think I'm like, I've like readied my weapon because I don't know if somebody's coming down here or, or what, but it sounds like a lot of voices and they might be trying to chant or something. And, and I'm looking to try and figure out and, you know, kind of cocking my head tilt my ears in different directions to see if I can tell which direction it's coming from. Is it coming from back the way I came? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in, in the cave, of course, because of the strange auditory properties of being in a cave, this this will be kind of tricky, right? Like you're, you know, in the way, but the way you've described it, I think you would be able to pinpoint where it's coming from. Give me a discern realities roll, please. All right. We got an eight. What should I be on the lookout for? The voices are coming from below, deeper. In fact, it sounds like they're coming from beneath the altar, possibly. What do you do? Like, they're coming from directly beneath the altar or from beneath everywhere? If you go and examine the altar, you're going to... So the altar is kind of like a... It's probably more accurately described as like a, a large plinth or sort of box atop which there is a slab. Hmm. And as you get closer to it, you see now that the slab is moved ever so slightly off the sort of box, the stone box structure. And the voices are coming up from that box structure. Hmm. All right. Then I'm going to just try and rip this stone top off of the structure yeah you can do that i mean i think i don't need to roll here i mean this i guess if you were like if there was danger you maybe a ben bars lift gates would be appropriate but there's no danger right now and you can put you can slide it off slide it aside and uh, yeah it opens up to a big yawning blackness <laughs> there's a ladder this is a, a shaft of some sort did the voices get louder oh yes how loud it sounds like hundreds at first it just sounds like a, almost like a like you initially when it gets louder it almost like sounds like just a a loud buzzing but you know you can make out distinct voices there are many many people down there wherever whatever's at the bottom of that shaft they're down there uh, muttering continuously I'm gonna take my torch and drop it see how far the shaft goes pretty far can I see the bottom nope so my my torch just went down and down and down and then there was just blackness it may have hit something. Maybe it hit some water, a little unclear, but uh, you might see like an ember or a pinprick of light. It's not bottomless, but it's pretty far down. Hmm. All right. So I've walked down this passageway and I've ended up at the bottom of this cave with an open roof. Is there any other like paths or is this the way? Well, give me a discern realities with a plus one for following up on the last one. All right. We get a nine. One question. What here is not what it appears to be. You are looking around the cave for 
another exit, correct? Right. And you don't see anything. You're not finding anything. But what you thought were glimmers of moisture from your torchlight, you realize now are actually a canopy of stars, the heavens, drawn, inked with shiny silver ink all over the walls and cave ceiling. It's a replica of the sky and the floor as well, almost like a spherical thing. What do you do? Well, that's neat. <laughs> I went through a lot of trouble. So even the great glowing star or energy or whatever it is directly ab- above is just, it's just a picture. It's not really there. Ah, well, you have spent some time in the temple recovering from your wounds. So you've had some time to get acquainted with this. I mentioned that the star drawings are on the floor as well, right? As if like this was a 360 degree view of the heavens, like all around the earth or something, right? Mm -hmm. The peerless star would be situated right where the altar is. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. What has my sister gotten herself into and what am I about to follow in her footsteps towards? And I get my weapon in a loose position so I can at least get to it if I need to, but not like, so I have to hold it. And so it'll still stay on my body as I start to descend this ladder. You're going down the ladder, down the shaft quite far, so far that you you occasionally stop and kind of brace yourself against the other side of the shaft to rest, right? And then continue climbing. As you get deeper and deeper, that murmuring starts to become a cacophony. And you don't know what the nature of the murmuring is necessarily. Well, I should say you don't know what the words they're speaking. That's the part that's unclear. But you're starting to get a feeling. And the feeling you're getting is, it's almost like a record being recited. It's almost like words trapped in the farthest depths of the outer planes of existence to lands beyond the black gate of death to various terrible primal planes It's like words being drawn forth, being brought forth and spoken aloud in this plane of existence. Why you have that feeling? Who knows? Magic. But I would like to know, for a moment, as you're traveling down, you almost have a sensation of like you're someone else going deeper into a space that you should not be going. You even begin to think that this story, your story, you, Lucero, maybe that's not even your name, right? Why do you think that? How do you think that? Why do you have that feeling of, like, what's something that you start thinking about that makes you think that, like, you're slipping away right now? So I, like, doused my torch before I started climbing down here just because it's way too difficult to try and do that. And for climbing down and resting against the wall for a while and then continuing on this, like, it's one of those things where if you just stay in darkness for too long, doing a tedious task, like, you you just start to have kind of waking dreams almost. And it's almost like a fever dream of just, like, you know, not being yourself. You're know, letting your mind wander. And I think that, like, I was thinking about my sister, and I think that, like, I just start to have the these like this waking dream of like being her and climbing down here or going somewhere. The voices quite suddenly stop as you get near the bottom of the shaft. Some of the voices that seem nearer to where you are begin to make sounds of fright, almost like like strange noises you might make if you were having a bad dream, jerky, 
sort of quick inhalations and exhalations of breath, some kind of terror, and then you hear hissing, the hissing of a very, very large snake. Listeners, that was our show. Uh, Discern Realities is a production of The Gauntlet. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can tweet us at Gauntlet RPG. We are on G+. Just go to the community section of G+, and search for The Gauntlet. You will find us there. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. And we are on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. David, thanks so much. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, listeners. Take care. 